What's up, everybody, and uh, Happy New Year. Matt here. I hope everyone listening had a uh, restful holiday break. Uh, Composer Code is back in 2019 and really hitting the ground running with a uh, slew of new Composer interviews. Uh, Before we dive into today's conversation, I just want to remind everyone listening that the the best belated Christmas present you can give me is an iTunes review. It takes a few seconds, and uh, these suckers really help get the podcast into more ears and shows the iTunes algorithm that were legit. Uh, Cupid GX gave the podcast uh, five stars on iTunes. Thank you so much. Uh, They wrote great resource. Uh, Matt connects us with composers from all different backgrounds and experiences. Media composers at any point of their career or journey can benefit from the insight discussed in these podcasts. Definitely worth checking out. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. So that's a perfect segue into introducing today's guest and the composer of the track you heard on the play-in, Tony Manfredonia. Tony's a composer, orchestrator, and a YouTube content creator uh, with a penchant for four-part harmony and chiptune instrumentation. So naturally, I had to reach out to see if you wanted to be on the show. So I won't spoil what Tony's been working on. I'll let him talk about that. But uh, Tony, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate the four-part uh, four part harmony there. <laughs> I, Absolutely, man. I love it. I'm a sucker for four-part harmony. And coming off of the, uh, the holiday season, I'll tell you what, there's some amazing... Uh, Christmas hymns, like Christmas songs, have some of the coolest four-part harmonies of any song. Don't even get me started. I'm a, I'm a church music director. I play the organ as well as all, all the stuff that I do. And so oh, like, I was, I was in my pri- I'm always in my prime at Christmas when I'm playing those hymns. I'm like, oh, yeah, look, this is great. That's right. That's, that's what you live for. <laughs> You're right. Um, so I want to start out just because I'm super interested in like origin stories. I want to ask you, you know, how you got involved uh, in music, specifically video game music, why that um, uh, kind of it plays a big role in your life because obviously video game music is such a niched kind of music. Um, so I'd love to hear about kind of your growing up, how you got involved in music and how video games played a part in that. Sure thing. Yeah, great question. Um, so, I mean, I grew up playing games, uh, mainly Nintendo. I was never really into the whole PlayStation, Xbox thing until later in life. But I grew up playing a lot of Nintendo, which meant Mario, which meant Legend of Zelda, Kirby. I mean, all so many games that have such good soundtracks. I sort of grew up listening. And, um, you know, I think I think that also it helped being in a family of musicians. You know, my mom, when I was a kid... Uh, kind of what I do now, play the organ for churches. And so when I was like literally an infant, I would be sitting behind the organ as she was doing her stuff. And so I kind of grew up with it. Um, My brother played piano, my sister sang, my dad played guitar. So that was definitely helpful. And of course, playing video games, uh, the music, it definitely just had an impact. You know, I think of like, even when I became like nine, 10 years old, uh, and dived into Final Fantasy for the first time. Final Fantasy VII was my first one I played. Uh, you know, the, it, w- it wouldn't be Final Fantasy without the music. I mean, that is, sure. you know, it, it just, it makes that much of a difference. And so, of course, you know, Banjo-Kazooie, you know, games earlier in life, Banjo-Kazooie or, or uh, uh, I even like Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was mm-hmm. in terms of like soundtracks. I, I loved it. Um, and I wish I could find it. I have an old cassette of me like adding lyrics to the clock town music. <laughs> I don't know. That's what amazing. It is, but if I ever find it, if once I, if I get like a million subscribers, that'll be the gift. For people. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great gift. And that song is very lyrical. So it's yeah, very well suited to lyrics. I forget. I forget how it goes. I wish I could find it. Hey, I dig, I'm digressing, but, um, you know, so of course I, I would, I learned how to play piano cause my mom played piano and, so, of course, naturally, my brother and I, we would try and find, you know, free sheet music online of like, you know, uh, Treasure Trove Cove and all that stuff from Banjo because it was like mm-hmm. hits, uh, Super Mario or Kirby tracks. Um, so that was definitely, I think, my just my experience with it. It just it was sort of a part of my childhood. Like it wouldn't have been the same without it. So do you have a, a particular game? I know you mentioned a bunch um, that maybe drove you to this path of, man, I'd like to make that kind of music. I, you know, I, I mentioned uh, Majora's Mask and I, I, I stick to my guns with that one, mainly because the music out of all the Zelda entries, well, number one, I should say it's distinctly Koji Kondo, like you can tell. Mm-hmm. 
this just the harmony choices are so different than any other Zelda games. Like they're just mm-hmm. a little eerie. You know, I think of like the they are. when even like the title screen music where there's the the clock town tune is playing and then there's like this like almost like polytonal moment where like the Majora's theme starts kind of like finding its way in there or like moving its way in there. And I was like, what is happening? This is. So- mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course, when the, the uh, you know, the clock town theme as the moon gets closer, the super, you know, dissonant bass tones that are rising underneath. I mean, that's, it's utterly terrifying. Yeah, it's great. And I, yeah, when you're like six years old, it, yeah, it's like genuinely terrifying. You're like, yeah, I it, love really this, is. But it also creeps me out. <laughs> right. Sure. Majora's mask. That's awesome. So kind of what was your journey to getting into video game music? Was it something that you intentionally set out to do or was it you just kind of were making music and you, you, um, you started landing gigs? Can you tell me a little bit about how you kind of inserted yourself into the industry? Yeah, uh, it's actually a, a, a unique... Uh, I mean, it wasn't something that I originally intended, to be honest, to be quite frank. Um, I went to school. My very first school uh, was Montclair State University. Um, I was only there for a year because it was, at, I mean, full disclosure, it was out of state tuition and was just like, there's, there's no reason for me to do this because I, I was originally living in Pennsylvania at the time and uh, it's a school in New Jersey. But studying composition there, I, I auditioned and got accepted mainly from like singer songwriter type stuff, actually. Um, that was sort of the, most of the music that I was writing was more so like piano and vocals. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but when I was there, kind of learning more about like the core of composition, because I always kind of wanted to do that, like to add strings and to add other things. Um, I met a composer there. His name is Andrew Allenson. Um, and and I, to be honest, I haven't talked to him in so long. But uh, he was making games with his brother. And actually, I don't know if you've been seeing, it's coming out on this like very soon, a uh, game called Y2K, a, post, a postmodern RPG. I think that's its full title. It's an indie. Rings a bell, but I'm not yeah, terribly. It's an RPG with it. that's coming out, and he's the lead composer. But back when we were in college, he and his brother were making a game, and he just asked me. He said, "Could, could we? Could, could like, could I help you? Or um, excuse me, he asked me like, would you mind helping me with some tracks? So it was sort of just like I wasn't like a like a lead composer by any means. I would just sort of take material that he did and just kind of rescore it or retranscribe it or rearrange it. Um, but it was sort of what got me hooked on the process. Um, mm-hmm. It was very, very, it was very, very early in that I was just doing just notation and exporting MIDI files. I wasn't doing any production, no nothing. But it was mm-hmm. help him out, and I, you know, it's it's so cool to see him now working. And this game is launching, and it's a huge game, uh, and it's it's really neat to see he and his brother and the rest of the team. I didn't work on it, but yeah, the rest of the team, you know, having something that the you know the world is going to play in it. It's it's a it's a huge thing. Um, so it was kind of neat to know that I got, he was sort of the person that got me into, into writing for games. Um, even though, again, I haven't worked with him or talked to him in so long. Uh, so it was, it was sort of just like a who I knew at the time, just kind of, Mm -hmm. and then from there, after that little project, I, uh, I started doing my own, you know, I started, I started saying like, well, I have to learn how to produce. I have to learn how to equalize and compress and all that stuff because I can't rely on you know, an audio engineer to basically work with my MIDI files, but rather I need to be able to learn how to do it on my own. And so throughout college, while I was studying how to compose music for live ensembles or live performers, I was also on the side shooting for gigs, doing game jams, uh, basically just networking and finding work while I was still in school to just kind of do it. This way, when I was graduated, I kind of already had stuff under my belt, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Can you talk to us a little bit about the game that you're currently working on? I understand if you're under NDA, you know, share as much as you're able, but I understand that you're currently working on a big project. Um, maybe how you got that project and what your process has been like for that. Sure thing. Yeah. Uh, so I'm working on Karen's Crypt. Uh, it's an indie title, very much inspired by uh, Legend of Zelda um, Link's Awakening for the Game Boy. And it's a dun- I mean, it's all dungeons, no, sh- no like towns and stuff like that. It's just basically dungeon to dungeon to dungeon. But um, it is going to come out ideally this year uh, for PC and Nintendo Switch. Um, and the music, uh, the music itself, I can talk. There are some public tracks, um, and even I can talk about some others. Uh, you can't hear them yet. But um, 
I reached out to the developers of that game when they were doing a Kickstarter for their very first, they had another game that they eventually want to work on. It was called Necrocosmos, something else entirely, almost like Metroid. But mm. the reason I reached out was because uh, they had sample, like a sample soundtrack, and it was basically like Bach music that was turned into 8-bit tunes, like literally transcription mm. of Bach as 8-bit music. And I right. was freaking out. I was like, this is awesome. So I just reached out just to say, you know, this is really cool that you're like, you want to use Bach in 8-bit form. Um, but then I said, you know, but if you ever wanted custom music, like just let me know. Like I'm all about Bach and PowerPoint. Like if you want something in a style, like I'd be happy to help you out. Um, and of course, it, at the time, because the Kickstarter didn't pass, they couldn't pay me or, or they, didn't, they, they didn't feel like they could hire me because they're like, well, we didn't pass this Kickstarter. We, we're not, we, can't, we can't pay you. But then mm-hmm. it was almost a year and a half later when they started uh, Kickstarter for Karen's Crypt, which did pass. And then after that, they asked me, they said, okay, we, you know, we got the funding. Let's, let's do this. Like we're, you're mm-hmm. on board. Um, and I think it was just, it, it probably helped that they wanted music in the style of Bach. So the soundtrack itself, it has a lot of organ, you know, as when you think of Bach, you think of organ or, or, uh, you know, piano or harpsichord, Mm -hmm. lots of cannons and fugues and fugados, a lot of counterpoint. I mean, there's a lot of 18th century counterpoint at the, at the root of the music. So I think of even like the main theme, you know, the main theme has this, uh, you know, uh, it's very chromatic, you know, very Mm -hmm. And so the reason I was kind of going for that was I, I listened to a bunch of Bach music and you think of like the famous D minor Toccata and Fugue, you know, right, right. Bum, 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 bum. You know, the real, almost like you're entering into a castle with thunder and lightning and rain, you know, it just, it just has that mood. And for that, sure, that's what they wanted. And so, so much of the music not only has that chromatic nature, um, but incorporates canons, incorporates fugues, incorporates what made Bach Bach, really. Um, and to, I mean, to be, to be quite frank, there are two tracks, when you, when you die, and then uh, a prelude to, like, almost like the opening sequence, are actual uh, transcriptions of Bach music. So there are two tracks that are of Bach, but I applied, um, that, excuse me, that are by Bach, that I used 8-bit, 16-bit, kind of to keep it that retro feel. Um, so just because of, because of how much his inspiration contributed, they were like, yeah, let's, let's actually use public domain Bach music and throw it into the soundtrack because that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was neat. So there's no legal ramifications, obviously, because it's (laughs) over a hundred years. So it's like, it's like copyright or yeah, exactly. So the, the, any sort of legal claim to it is, has, uh, has expired. That's really cool. When you got the gig. Um, I'm curious about your process. So, so you, okay, you land it. What's the first thing you do? Do you just go sort of soak yourself in Bach as much as possible? Do you kind of like jot some ideas down on the piano? Cause I'm fascinated by the creative processes of composers. So if you could just walk me through, um, let's say you're beginning the first song or, or even take me back to when you get the gig, kind of what's your process for, for composing for Karen's script? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it took a little bit. So when I, when I, when, when we first started, they gave, they gave me uh, samples. They said, here are all the temp tracks. And again, the temp tracks, kind of like the game they were originally working on, all the temp tracks were just Bach music in, you know, just kind of un, unmastered, unmixed 8-bit sounds. And it was just an 8-bit sound set that had Bach MIDI files attached to them. Mm-hmm. And so I used those as the reference points. I used, okay, if these are the tracks... By, these are the pieces by Bach that they like. Uh, admittedly, I forget which specific ones they were, but these are the pieces by Bach that they really like. I'm going to kind of look at the counterpoint and look at and look at what makes it Bach. You know, look so look look at what really appeals to these developers. And so after doing that, then I just basically dove right in, and they said, you know, the main theme is going to be the most important track for this game. They they hammered that they hammered that into my brain. They're like, you know, we, yeah. we want to make sure the main theme is is as memorable as can be. And so the first, you know, foray into the process was really just writing a bunch of uh, versions and revisions of the main theme until we came to something not only compositionally but uh, 
just sound sets, like the mixture of sounds. What am I using? AI, you know, triangle waves, saw waves, you know, a little bit of Super Nintendo strings in there. Um, and it was, it, was, it was basically this kind of, I don't want to say elongated, maybe a couple week process of really just fine tuning the sound set and fine tuning like mm. the style, the style of the music. Because once that was solidified, once that main theme was solid, then everything else, you know, Dungeon 1, Dungeon 2, uh, everything else that follows, you can, I, I could kind of harken back to that main theme. And yeah. in fact, so much of the music, I mean, every single track, at least once, and I do this intentionally, at least once, throws in a little bit of the main theme, at least the first four notes, that bum, 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 um, just because I'm like, you know what? Why not? <laughs> you know, kind of right, exactly. it all together. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I kind of want to run a contest when the game comes out this, to like say, whoever the first person to identify how many times I use the main theme throughout the soundtrack can like win some prize because it really is throughout every single track. It's in there, even if it's very subtle, even if it's just like two notes, it's there, you know, it's present. And that's interesting because I'm such a geek for like motivic uh, transformation and development. And in Link's Awakening, there's actually a ton of that, which is really interesting is it, it harkens back to the main theme a lot. Um, uh, 8 bit music theory actually did a video all about Link's Awakening and motivic uh, transformation. I think it's called, I'll, I'll link it in the description and I'll send it to you after this. And it's fascinating, but I'm such a geek for that. And I think that's really cool how you compose the first, tune and that sort of acted like a style guide you know for the rest of the for the rest of the of the um of the music like this is this is the style this is the instrumentation that we're sticking to right um, and, it, and i think that's cool it provides a cohesive sort of feel um you know one of the things that we had talked about over email is just uh uh composing in a notation software, you know, looking at the notes and stuff. And this is something that I have not always done. And I am just now sort of being uh, enlightened to, I, I never grew up reading music. I was actually a singer songwriter, very similar to yourself and yeah. did all my recording in the DAW or on demos. And I could sort of, you know, guffawed at reading music, you know, Paul McCartney can't read music. Why do I need to learn how to read music? <laughs> you know? And so I would start diving into transcribing and that's what really got me into using notation apps and now i'm totally sold where you know i start every piece that i write in a notation app before usually you know nine times out of ten before going to the daw um can you talk a little bit about why you're so intentional about that and maybe some of the advantages of that for sure well i'll talk about intention first and then advantages second intentions um mainly because if i mean i spent four years in college, studying music. I mean, even I took like an AP music theory class in high school. When you're studying music with texts, scores, uh, I mean, even studying counterpoint orchestration, none of it is demonstrated with piano rolls. 100% of that is often, if not, I mean, it's always, from my experience, you're looking at music, you're looking at stabs, you know, you're looking at, okay, well, there are the clarinets, there's this, there's that, you know, this mm -hmm. the harmony looks as a chord on a piano uh, score or something. Everything is notation. So when you're studying counterpoint, usually it's always Bach or, or one of his contemporaries when you're studying counterpoint. It's like, okay, you learn that on a staff. You learn that by notating it with the exercises your teacher gives you. And then, like, you, I mean, when I look at a piano roll, I don't think, I don't look at it the same way I look at it as, as if something's notated. Sure. I, I have a more difficult time looking at the harmony. If I just have all of my instruments open, and I look at the piano midis, the midi roll, I'm like, okay, sure. Looks like a mess. Yeah, right, right. I mean, yeah. especially if you have a lot of moving lines and stuff, sure, mm. you know what it sounds like, but visually, the, no the fact that the notation's not there, it, it, if you want to change something or alter something, fine, like once it's already written, fine. But in terms of composing on the fly directly into a piano roll, and you want something to be complex and contrapuntal and harmonically like solid, like a rock, I'm mm -hmm. far more difficult to do that directly into a piano roll than to notate first. Um, I mean, I just, I think of, I just think again, it's like, if you think about someone who let's say their primary instrument is, I don't know, trumpet or, or, or flute. Okay. Then they want to start composing. Good. All right. Great. Then they open a piano roll and they have a piano, in front, a MIDI piano in front of them. One of the biggest things that I, I know 
I don't know how they get, they get past is, okay, if they're not naturally a pianist, their music might reflect that. Like if they're, if they're making their music by pressing record and punching in the notes with a piano, but they're not actually a pianist, their music might suffer a little bit because they're not actually thinking about the counterpoint, the harmony and everything else because they're limited to how much they can actually play a piano. Mm, yeah. It might be very different. Um, but I think by putting it note by note in a notation software, you can actually construct it rather than just press record and play it. If that makes sense. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Now I'm not, I'm not dissing piano rolls. I think, I think like if someone can do that effectively, then great. Uh, I just know for me, I find it much more challenging. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an argument to be made that I've heard some people say that I don't necessarily agree with, but people say I've run into like, well, it's just faster to do it right in the, the DAW. And I say, well, yeah, it is. It might be faster, but I find that I get more overwhelmed and more confused. And I find myself saying like, I should have just notated this. Right. Cause I don't know. I don't know which line is, is moving where, and I don't know, you know, these are clashing in the fe- frequency spectrum. And, and if I could have just seen it laid out before moving to the DAW, I could have avoided all this. So while it may be faster for me, at least it's worse <laughs> and it's more overwhelming and it's more challenging. And I find myself wishing even, uh, you mentioned in one of your YouTube videos, which I, I watched and, and they're great. We'll get to that. Um, the, that even for like electronic pieces or ambient pieces, you, you would want to do that because you want to see everything laid out despite the genre. And I feel, I feel very, I feel very similarly about that. Yeah. Um, sort of segueing into uh, what you use. I know you use Sibelius. Um, are there any other tools that you uh, use? And this can be kind of hardware, software, keyboards, uh, MIDI controllers, anything that you, that you really can't live without when it comes to composing and get as geeky or technical as you want. Sure. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to actual like software and gear, I mean, I have my studio monitors in the room and I have headphones. Um, but really in terms of software, it's just Sibelius and Cubase. Um, now what I, what I will do is I will export, I have two monitors here. Um, what I, I will export the PDF. Uh, so I can have this because if you have Sibelius open at the same time as Cubase, I mean, your, your audio interface will just go haywire. So mm-hmm. I, I will, um, I will have the PDF kind of on one side of the monitor next to the mixing console. And on the other monitor is like everything else, you know, like the main, the main Cubase screen. Um, you know, really in terms of like what I can't live without in terms of software hardware, of course, having a keyboard for sure, in terms of like voice leading and like, where, okay, where are all these notes placed on an 88 key keyboard to make sure you mentioned like frequency spectrum or where, where will things clash? You know, I always, I think it's great to be able to kind of visually see on a, on a piano where, where the notes are being placed. So it doesn't seem like there's, okay, there's something missing in the middle or there's, it's just too many things on the top, whatever it may be. Um, but really, I don't really go much beyond that aside from like virtual instruments. You know, I use mm-hmm. this East West uh, Hollywood strings whatever, uh, East West, pretty much East West, 75% of East West, and then 25% of, um, whatever else I have or, or I'm, or I'm using, uh, usually Omnisphere, if I'm doing something ambient with like synth mm-hmm. or even like an orchestral synth hybrid Omnisphere, sort of my go-to. Uh, and of course for Karen's crypt, i am been using, uh, it's the super audio cart. I don't know if you've heard of it or used it. I, I have super audio cart. I really like it. It's great, especially more so for like the super Nintendo sounds. Oh yeah. I find that like the eight bit chip things can be a little overly harsh and I'm not sure why that, I think they're just cause it's pure, it's pure sound waves. Whereas mm. other things like block chip sounds or, um, uh, other chip tune software out there, they, they will like sample it from, the actual instrument or the actual uh, chip hardware, whereas yeah. audio carts, chip sounds in quotes, it's just mm. sound, it's pure sound waves. So you do a lot of EQ and stuff to make it not kill your ears. Um, right. But uh, I do use that almost, in, I mean, in every single Karen's Crypt track, it's, it's in there one way or the other. I do incorporate, not to spoil too much, but I do incorporate down, down the road in some tracks, uh, like some realistic instruments to kind of, create this weird like 8-bit 16-bit realistic hybrid um mm, that's really cool once the game comes out people will get to hear because there's there's some checks i won't say anything but it gets it gets crazy um 
<laughs> and I laugh. That's awesome. I'm excited to finally share it when it comes out. You know what I'm saying? And you said it's coming to the switch. It'll be in the switch. I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, don't quote me on this, but I, I don't know if it'll come at the same time as the PC release, but hands down, it's coming to the switch. I know one way or the other cool. it's on switch for sure. That's fantastic. Well, I'll definitely be sure to pick it up on the switch. I've really enjoyed playing indie games on the switch. So I will awesome. definitely check that out. Thanks. Um, when I spoke, what you talked about kind of reminded me of something, um, that, uh, I, I spoke with, um, some composers on my, on my first episode, uh, the super Mercado bros, they have a podcast and, um, do you know about them? No, I, I actually don't, but the name is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, they're fantastic. They have, they have the most consistent, high quality video game music podcast. I think I've ever, I've ever heard it's, it's really good. Um, I'll, I'll also link that in the description, but, um, they said, uh, you know, I, I was, um, I was pleased to hear kind of what you said is like, you know, there's really not much that I can't live without. Um, because what they said, one of the biggest things that they see novices focus on is gear infatuation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've fallen prey to that, uh, just full disclosure. Like I've just in 2018, I, I bought, you know, a massive set of plugins that I thought I needed, but I ended up using one of a bundle of like, 50 plugins, you know, wow. uh, I've bought monitors that I couldn't use because my room wasn't acoustically treated. Like I, I am so bad at that. Um, so what's something that you think or that you've observed maybe novices focus on that's a waste of time. You know, it's, and it's actually, I kid you not. Like as soon as you were talking to like mentioned the word novices, the first word that I came was, was gear, like gear. Uh, people can spend way too much time just, you know, finding just the right VST instrument. It's like, well, do I pick Spitfire strings or Albion one or East West Hollywood strings? It's like, you know what? My, my two cents is number one, you don't really want to be in a bunch of debt. So if you have to use a credit card to buy your virtual instruments, like try to avoid that, you know, right. My feeling is I was like, okay, save up some money, you know, with whatever work and buy something something you can use to then make more money. But the trap I fell to into four years ago when I first started working in this industry was like, you know what, heck, I'm just going to buy a big package of virtual instruments. And it's like, it was only just, I think like a couple of years ago where I guess it was about two to three years. So before, yeah, before I got married, basically, uh, mm-hmm. paying off that thing. And I wasn't, I mean, at that time I was just start. I was just starting. I barely knew anybody in the industry. I was, I had that like one project that I mentioned at the start of this interview. Uh, and then after that, I was like, what the heck? I'm just going to buy all these instruments. And then I had to pay it off down the road. So a lot of the gigs that I was making, I wasn't really like putting towards myself. It was just like putting toward paying off what I bought. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. I'm yeah, yeah. College too, which is like you're already broke. Um, and so I think that like find something, you know, for sure, if you're going to invest like $500 in a string library or a brass library, sure, you want to, you want to kind of compare and contrast, but don't, don't, number one, break the bank and don't break your head over it. Like just, if, if it's $500, it's going to be good. You know, it's going to mm-hmm. be pretty solid that you kind of have to make it your own. Um, and I think novices just assume, well, the $1,500 Spitfire package will make me a good composer. It's like, well, not really. Like you got to, you can get something that's like $200 and still create a, br- a pretty good product. Uh, for- right. Right. That's great advice, man. Um, I'm curious. We, we had talked about briefly, I mentioned that you've, uh, you're an orchestrator and that you do, you have some experience orchestrating things. That's one uh, side of composition and arrangement that is very mysterious and daunting to me. Sure. Um, when you have like a piano sketch and I know this isn't in the set of questions that I sent you, so forgive me, but I'm, I'm selfishly asking for my own benefit. Um, what are some tips for orchestration that you've found to be, you know, tried and true or, and, or how do you go about orchestrating like a piano sketch? Like, like say you have your piano sketch in Sibelius, where do you usually start? Um, well, I usually, I always have to, I mean, when looking at it and when playing it back, I'm always thinking about color. Okay. So you, Every instrument group has some type of color and even instrument groups mixed together have some type of color. So for mm-hmm. I might go through my first step was going through a piano score and, you know, pressing playback and just thinking about sounds. Okay. If this piano figure or this eight measure chunk, okay, 
definitely want strings, you know, so I'll like write, you know, make a little note strings. Mm. Maybe may not, I may not fully realize that until I actually start orchestrating it, but just something to indicate, okay, I want strings. Okay. This piano melody, that would be brilliant for the oboe. Okay. Right. Oboe. So then I have, okay, then I have oboe and strings. All right. That's, that sets the stage. Let's just talk about an arbitrary eight measures. All right. So I wrote o- oboe, wrote strings. I know sort of what the orchestration is going to look like. Uh, maybe percussion depending. The next thing to keep in mind is that not everything written for piano will convey effectively to the orchestra. So you have, mm. to, if you have a C chord, C triad in your left hand and then some melody in the, in the right, okay, that C chord may have to be s- spread out a little more to give you more thickness and the orchestra sure. fullness. Uh, you know, so it's not just going to be a one, three, five right next to each other, or it might, right. be, it might be depending on what you want, but to mm-hmm. think about the actual nature of the instruments and the orchestra itself, uh, usually the piano sketch, I see it as, uh, uh, uh to serve the purpose of melodic content, harmonic content, uh, contrapuntal, like basically the, the most important rhythm, all that stuff, uh, right. but everything else in terms of how to place it in the orchestra, that comes from just knowing the orchestra that just comes from looking at orchestra scores and, and just knowing how to write for the orchestra. Uh, so the piano is basically just sets the stage in terms of the most important stuff, the actual Mm. music, the note by note music, everything else, how to place it on a page comes. That's, that's where the creative element of orchestrating happens. Mm, Yeah, that's very helpful. Do you have any particular scores or composers that you would recommend people like myself who maybe know the bare bones basics of like, I haven't spent much time with the orchestra, the uh, Orlando Philharmonic where I'm from was was kind enough to let me sit in on a rehearsal, which was really cool. Uh, that, That was that was quite an incredible experience. I've never seen an orchestra like up close. Yeah. Um, but I, I definitely am not as familiar with the timbres and the colors of each instrument as, as someone like you would be. Um, so what's the, what's the best step? Is it just listening? I mean, obviously it's listening to a ton of orchestral music, um, but do, are there any particular books or composers or scores that you would recommend someone to study that have helped you? Yes, absolutely. Um, the first one, if you haven't read it yet, it's a very popular one. It's a uh, Rimsky Korsakov's principles of orchestration. Now Rimsky Korsakov okay. was a composer, uh, I want to say in the mid 1800s. And so much of his music is almost like this. Uh, he might've even been a little bit later. I, I forgive me that my history is terrible, but um, a lot of his music, it's very romantic. It's very rom- romantic, uh, kind of leans into the, 20th century, slightly contemporary style, but really more, more romantic than not. So it's a great, it's, and it's a good text to, uh, he explains, he explains number one, the layout of the orchestra goes in the detail about the, um, uh, basically the instrument groups. So, you know, the woodwinds, the, the ranges, all that, um, their colors, their, their, whatever, type of uh, emotions they may convey. Um, but he also, as you get into it, you know, kind of teaches you through his own examples, through his own works. And one of his most favorite uh, famous pieces is called Scheherazade. It's his big orchestra work and it's great. And um, what he'll do is he'll say, okay, we're, the chapter may be talking about, you know, the melody in the strings doubled with the winds, for example. Then he'll say, mm-hmm. okay, so turn to the second half of the book and go to this page. And you'll get to, you can see it on a score. It's like, okay, so you can read what he's talking about. You can read why it works, how it works, when to use it, when not to use it. And then look at it as as an example of his own music uh, Mm. and kind of visually see it, visually see what he's talking about. That's really cool. And yeah, so if you haven't read an orchestration book before, it's the best one to dig into. Again, because it's over a hundred years old, the text itself may be a little bit uh, fluffy, if you will, a little bit dense, but it, it, it does make sense. Um, Mm -hmm. now, alternatively, if you go to literally the letters, I M S L P dot org, Mm -hmm. that's public domain in terms of music is on there. So if you just want to go, I don't know, let's say you want to like, you hear something in Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker next Christmas or something. You're like, what, what the heck did Tchaikovsky do in that moment in the Nutcracker? Go to imslp.org, find the Nutcracker. It's on there. And then you can literally see what he did orchestrationally uh Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just any public domain score so what i recommend is find an orchestral piece or find a random orchestral piece by some famous composer over the last 300 years and listen and look 
you know, and maybe break it down. Okay, what are the strings doing for this first movement? Okay, then what are the winds doing for this first movement? Okay, then the brass. Okay, then what are the brass and strings doing against each other? How are they acting together? And so it may take a few listens and it may take a lot of time, but it does help you really figure out how to do it. If that makes sense. That's really cool. Yeah. That makes a lot, you know, what's, what's funny is I actually, I do have that book. Uh, and I started, what, what I did was I started reading it like before bed, like in bed. And I was like, okay, this is not a before bed in bed reading book at all. This is, this is probably the antithesis to before bed reading. I'm looking at charts of ranges, you know, as I'm about to drift off to sleep uh, of instrument ranges. So what I did was I was kind of like, this is a little overwhelming. So life kind of got in the way and I set it aside, but I've always been, you know, always been thinking about that book and like, I really need to get back. So your endorsement inspires me again to, uh, to come back to that. So, so I appreciate that. Yeah. And for real quick, if another plug for another book, if, if anyone who has already read that, who's listening has already read that book or has already read the basics of orchestration textbooks, if you want to level up your orchestration skills, get to like level 99, uh, go and find Henry Brant's. It's called Henry Brant's textures and timbres. Uh, it's basically the next step. It's like, okay, if you know how to orchestrate in the romantic style, because Rimsky Korsakov told you how, then go to Henry Brandt and, and read Textures and Tambors because it, 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 oh, it is like an eye-opener. It's like, holy cow, I didn't know things like this were even, I didn't even think of stuff like this. Just talks about color. Doesn't talk about construction. Doesn't talk about like where and, you know, all the highs and the lows and how to place harmony, but just like, okay, if you want this color to come out of the orchestra, do this. And it's great. That's really amazing. It's really cool. It's really, really cool. I'll definitely put that in the description. I've actually never even heard of that guy. So I'll definitely check that out. It was a professor at Juilliard who I met who said, he said, if you want to orchestrate, you got to find this book because so it was just, it was a, it was a random meeting I had with him. And he said, I didn't go to Juilliard by the way. So, but I just knew, I knew of him and he said, you got to get this book. So it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. That's really cool, man. Um, well, you know, switching gears a little bit, uh, the, the way that I found you was that I was like, man, I need to make a video about teaching modes through video game music because, you know, people, nobody has ever done that. And so I search and naturally I find your videos and I'm like, oh good, someone's done it. Yeah. So, um, I really, really enjoyed, uh, your, your mode lessons sure. uh, through some of the Zelda series and stuff. And I'll definitely, I'll post all that in the description so people can check that out for themselves. Um, what are your plans for YouTube? You know, do you have any, do you have any, uh, any more content plans for the future? Cause I really enjoy the content I've seen from you so far. Yeah. You know, right now I have, uh, kind of, you mentioned the mode videos and that was part of a series I made about pre-existing video game music uh, called small change and massive difference. Right now I have a series kind of going in a sense when I have time and, and just, I try to do it at least monthly. Uh, Small Change, Massive Difference 2, which is based upon people submitting their own music, whether it's from a game or video game based uh, style of track. Um, people can submit their own tracks, you know, even just the audio file, and I'll transcribe it and find some type of music theory to teach out of it. So I have more of those planned. It's probably going to be like an, a series that just goes on for infinity so until I run out of topics. Um, and then I kind of want to return to Orchestration Station, which I sort of did kind of to bridge the gap between two areas of my life at one point when I was like, didn't have as much going on. And I was like, well, I need to fill the gap somehow, but I want to go back to that and uh, do a little bit more in depth of the technique of orchestrating rather than just kind of the previous overviews of instruments that I was had, had going on. Um, and as for like new or different content, different from those things that I'm doing, I kind of did a big overview of notation. I think you were mentioning it. And I said, I, yeah, I'll, 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 once I'll link that as well in the description. It's, uh, it's really good. It's like a several part series on your whole process. Yeah. And they're kind of longer videos, kind of a, it's just one big overview where you can see my hands and all my hotkeys and stuff, but I kind of want to do a, a, a more in depth series of like the nitty gritty of if you write music in Sibelius, like how to make that process almost seamless. Just so like, okay, if you're writing chords, okay, how do you implement chords quickly? Okay. If you're writing counterpoint, how do you write counterpoint quickly? So mm. I kind of want to go and make a video series about that a little bit. I uh, haven't really fine tuned it, but it's my sort of like next on my list. That's awesome, man. Um, well, I want to ask you for, uh, if you could offer, I know we've talked a little bit about how you landed the, the Karen's crypt gig. Um, your, uh, thoughts on, uh, how to, if someone wants to make this a career or if someone wants to make money doing this, making, making music for games, 
What have you found to be uh, successful tactics or habits that people who are wanting to break into this industry can start to adopt? Sure. Um, great question. And, you know, full disclosure. And again, I, I make this known on my Twitter and stuff. It's like, I don't do this full time. Truth, truthfully, uh, I, do, I do still have, in a sense, a day job. I play the organ for a church um, and kind of run their choir and stuff. Um, but I am also blessed that composition has provided my wife and I enough income where she doesn't have to work full time, you know, so it is, it is, it is good. It is possible. I just want to put it out. Mm-hmm. It's possible, but you may have to be at your day job for longer than you initially want to. For sure. Just, I'm still at my day job. You right. know, I, it's, it's a slow process. You it know, it's is, a slow oh, process. Um, and so really in terms of breaking into it, 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 it's a sad truth, but it's, it's also, I'm, I've kind of accepted this, this truth is that sometimes it does come down to who, you know, and about, it's about networking. Um, mm-hmm. Because the, the reality is, is that there are more composers, game composers, than there are games being made. Right. Or like right. Full professional releasing on multi-platform games. And so what happens is, is that people, oh, I want to write music for games. And then they just, nothing wrong with like emailing random developers and saying, hey, I want to write you music. Okay, fine, go for it. But the chances of that giving you some level of, of consistent return is much slimmer than if you were to just, Either if you live in a metropolitan area, then network there. I'm sure there's meetups. Or uh, if you live in a rural community like myself, I live in the middle of countryside Michigan where it's snowing every day. Uh, Twitter and the internet is your best friend um, Mm -hmm. because it really comes down to making friends and making connections. And the, the people you connect with in terms of just saying, hey, I like your game and following them, even if they already have a composer, you don't know if their next game, if that composer is still going to be there. If you, were, if, you, if you were their friend for two years and promoted their game and played their game and were BFFs with them, basically, you don't know if they, if they want to hire you, but the chances right. are very high. The chances for sure. are very high. And so uh, basically just be nice and keep learning. Keep writing, keep learning, and be nice and befriend people in the industry. And the work will come, I promise. You have to be, you, you do have to be willing to put yourself out there and to say, Hey, like I could totally write music for your game. I have this vision. I have this, you know, I want to meet your vision, but I have this idea. Would you be willing to hear my idea? You know, you have to be kind of in a sense, assertive, uh, mm-hmm. you want to be like a salesman. You don't want to be just emailing everybody and saying, let me write you music. You kind of, you know, pick and choose a little bit, be, you know, focus on what you're good at. That's probably, I probably should have said that from the start. Focus on what you're good at. You're good at writing mm. music for guitar. Okay, what kind of games are good for guitar? Uh, Westerns or, or like cute platformers? Find those developers. Find them. Mm, yeah. Than that. You know what I'm saying? That's really good advice. Yeah, that's really, really good advice. Um, for your future and kind of when you look down uh, the tunnel of time, what, what ideally do you want for yourself in your career in, in games or in music? Or um, do you want to do it full time or are you kind of happy where you're at? Um, what is like your ideal, maybe five year plan? Yeah. Five year plan. I mean, ideally I would like to be writing music in general full time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also, I mean, and you, you may see, have seen on my website and stuff. I also write a bunch of music for, um, like just pure concert music, you know, just for concert bands or, or wind symphonies or, or solo piano or solo oboe or whatever it may be. I also write kind of like the contemporary concert music scene stuff as well. Um, mm-hmm. and so in a sense, I've made it work. I, I, I've, I've sort of been able to kind of juggle the, the video game music and just kind of concert classical music as well. Um, you know, I, I like the stability of a day job. I, and I, I'm blessed to, have, to be working in music, to be honest. You know, it's, it's not like my day job is not music. Um, so I'm very, I feel very grateful for that. Mm-hmm. But there are days, there are more days than not where I'm like, ah, I have this great idea, but I have to be here for the next eight hours. I would like to be home. You know, so I think in five years, it would be awesome to be working full time writing music. But I, I don't, I don't want to say I want to limit myself to one genre or the other. In fact, sure. I'd love to be able to write music for games. And then kind of what I've already done is bring that soundtrack to then the concert stage. You know what I'm saying? Because mm. I, I, love, I love both worlds. You know, I, I know people right. in both worlds and I love it. So uh, that's what I'd like. But who knows if that'll happen? We'll see. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's cool, man. Well, it's, it's good. Cause you don't need to pigeonhole yourself, you know, cause a lot of those skills do translate over, right. um, you know, to those different worlds of music. So, uh, it's really cool, man. Well, uh, thanks so much for chatting, man. Before I let you go, where can people go? Although I've, I've, I'm going to link a bunch of, bunch of your stuff in the description. Uh, <laughs> where can people go to hear more about you, to hear your stuff and, uh, you know, maybe learn a little bit more about you. Yeah. Well, th- thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you can go to my website, which is my last name. So it's Manfredonia music.com. Um, or, I mean, you could just go into Google and type Tony Manfredonia and I'm really the, I, as far as I know, the only like Tony Manfredonia in the music world at all. So you can find me easily that way. Again, go to Twitter, search Tony Manfredonia and go to YouTube, search my name, SoundCloud, search my name. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm on most platforms, even Instagram, as much as I don't really use it that much. I'm on Instagram as well. Um, but my website is like the hub where you'll be able to find everything. You know, my videos, my uh, bio, my sound recordings, my whatever, my links to everything else. Like it's all on my website. That's probably the best place to go. Fantastic. Well, man, thank you so much uh, for taking the time out to chat. And uh, I've definitely learned something, uh, especially just about your, your thoughts on orchestration. And I think that's super valuable. Um, and I'm super excited to see, uh, to see the release of Karen's Crypt and what you do in the future. Hey, you're so welcome. This is a pleasure is all mine. Thank you. You got it, man.